Half a million New Zealanders took to the streets today in support of a separate Māori political system. Māori stand to make billions as claims over fisheries, flora and fauna and spectrum use are settled today. More violent unrest in the wake of the failed referendum for a separate Māori parliament. The beehive was firebombed this morning. Police blame Māori activists angry at the failed referendum. Under the controversial new Iwi Resource Act, all New Zealanders will pay user charges to local tribes for the use of roads and other resources in tribal areas. Hot on the heels of Australia, New Zealand declares itself a republic. The Tuhoi state came into being today, formalising Tuhoi tribal territory as a self-governed zone. Critics say the separate nation will be short-lived. In an official ceremony today, the president signed a declaration changing New Zealand's official name to Aotearoa. New Zealand is no more. Take yourself forward to the year 2050. New Zealand is now Aotearoa. Māori have tino rangatiratanga, absolute sovereignty. Although we have one united upper house of parliament, there are now two houses of representatives, Māori and Pākehā. Māori have become a nation within a nation. Māori now provides services to Māori in areas such as education, health, welfare and justice. There are separate tax structures dedicated to fund the separate systems. Our population has changed. In 2050, we are over 20% Māori, nearly 30% Polynesian, Asian and other, and only 50% Pākehā. The Smiths on Auckland's North Shore are a typical New Zealand family. Sue Smith, educated before bilingualism, struggles with her native tongue. Her Pākehā husband, Joe, struggles with a lot of the change, change that often makes him feel like a foreigner in his own country. For their children, born into the new system, this is all they know. Sam has always been fluent in two languages, as is his sister Rachel, who, like her brother, comfortably straddles the Pākehā and Māori worlds. The Smiths are our coffee-coloured mixed-race future, the typical Kiwi family predicted for 2050. They are our children, our grandchildren, the future us. If you look at this colour of the skin, that, that, that's actually the, the colour of the future, brown. In fact, you look at the face here, and that's the face of the future. The muku is the, the future. We won't be calling New Zealand New Zealand. We'll be calling New Zealand as it is now uh, in the year 2050, Aotearoa. I'd say the doors of Marae like this would be flung wide open. Tanga means uh, absolute chieftainship. Chieftainship, authority, those sorts of words, yeah, pretty much just sums it up for me. Nowadays it's also being interpreted as a guarantee of Māori sovereignty, of Māori self-determination. The Māori I know don't give a rat's ass about Māori sovereignty. <laughs> The whole question of Tino Rangatiratanga seems to me once again to be a kind of a of a confused, woolly cardigan, reactionary left issue. Uh, but if you were to ask me what I think, it's um, I seek, or I and my tribe seek the right to manage our own affairs, the people in our hapu, and the resources that belong to us in our own way. And in effect, the, the whole thing about Tino Ranga Tiratanga is what you hear. While Tino Rangatiratanga is based on the idea of a nation within a nation, there are fears that tribal divisions would lead to further splintering into separate tribal nations. Well, what are you talking to those boys all weekend, <laughs> right? Rachel? Why not? Oh, no, look. Oh, they're going to speak English this time? Yeah. Take it easy, Dad. You'll make Rachel cry again. Oh, shut up! <laughs> Mum, can I please do the translating? Well, I think Sam should do it. It's not fair. How am I supposed to get better if you don't let me practice? When you're in Tuhoi, you do it the Tuhoi way. There's a Tuhoi dialect. There are rules and regulations that are based on Tuhoi, and they have been for thousands of years. We're not a group of people that just sort of kind of fall out of the sky. <laughs> we were here long before 1350. Passports. Oh, yeah. 
Nee. 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 Wants to know how long we're going to spend here. Tell him we'll only be as long as we have to. We're driving straight through to the coast. Oh, but you said we could have a swim before. I changed my mind. Oh, Joe. Get the hip and watch you, Mato. Get the takutai. Kapai. This notion that somehow some people will live off of tolls extracted from drivers who drive through their land. I mean, it just the whole thing seems so absurd as a as a way of going back really to the 19th century rather than forward into the 21st. Cutting a two hoy would take to the hills again. Well in some respects they've never come down. If they can find some level of comfort in that, if they can find their own way, if their society is intact, then I say the best of luck to them. If you wish to have a swim, the lake's rather warm. Dad, can we please go? Mum, come on, help me. Yeah, come on, Joe. Go for a swim, I guess. Yeah. No, it's not going to happen, and that's the whole misconception about Tiruranga Tiratanga, is is that um, you know it's going to be you know two Hawaiian nations are going to be fenced off, and you know and there's a sort of um, like the Berlin Wall is going to be built around the Uruweta. I don't think that anybody wants to see a situation, for example, uh, where Māori take over huge chunks of national parks and close them off to everybody. We'll see secessions on an iwi basis if we force that situation. But in 2050, we will still be almost 80% non-Māori, and race or culture-based economic privilege has always proved a bitter pill for some to swallow. Presumably, every population has its uh, percentage of lunatics. Our population, as it goes up, that number of lunatics will increase. How many do you need to make up a, an army and wave a flag? And any attempt, any, attempt in New Zealand to enforce a minority will on the majority would have the kind of consequences you have anywhere. Pressure just builds and things explode. If New Zealand truly was inhabited by a predominantly white, redneck, racist minority, then the ACT political party would have got more than 5% at the last election. Well, there's an understandable sense amongst many Pākehā that Māori will want to do to us what we did to Māori. When you look around New Zealanders, we're very, very easy going. To a fault, many believe. But there will be an issue that will come along, which one day will get those quiet, easy going people in a right old twos. And uh, who knows what might happen. Worst case scenario, some of them even imagine what's happening in Zimbabwe, you know, with white farmers being thrown off their land by black tribes that maybe owned it 200 years before. You know, farmers love their land, and if their land was under threat, they would certainly take up arms. You know, they've, um, you know, they've all got at least one double-barrel shotgun. <laughs> the essential part of the whole treaty settlement process is that private land is not affected. They're not going to come, I'm not going to have the EV knocking on my door wanting my house back. It's, it's not going to happen and as long as that situation remains in force and I can't imagine any government being lunatic enough to, uh, to change it, then I don't think we'll have that kind of doomsday scenario. Some years ago there was this kind of almost a conspiracy theory about Māori revolutionaries out there that uh, you've got a lot of Māori people in the army and they're taking the arms out of the armory and then training people in secret places and there were what a lot of nonsense but the tabloids ran that stuff you know it's scaring the horses and the pakehas all at once oh they will they will come to a sticky end there will be a white backlash against those people it's never happened and i'm absolutely confident it never will we listen to the 10 percent on the Paga side, um, you know, the rednecks, well, we're, we're in shit street, basically. If we listen to the 10% um, who are the fundamentalist Māori who want to kick everybody out, 
than were in Shit Street as well. So we round them up, find an island, and put them both on it. The most critical question is for us to recognise that Māori also need access to money. They need access to resources if they are to carry out the kind of work that is consistent with Tino Rangatiratanga. Dad, shouldn't we at least check there's some licences left before we put the boat in the water? Of course there'll be some, why wouldn't there be? Well, they're limited, and it's the weekend. Limit the license, limit the catch. The buggers just want more for themselves, I bet. So what are you going to do? Start a war? Go on, go check. If we're going to manage our fishing stock, we may have to have some form of registration, some form of, of control over even the amateur fishermen. If there's a system of paying fees, well, again, that's not abnormal. If you go down to Lake Taupo, you've got to pay a fee to go for trout fishing. You can't just hop on the lake and go. Kia ora. Kia ora. Well, hey, have you got any more licences left? Like most of the last day, eh? Yeah. Oh, well, you're in luck, young fella. Still got a couple left. So, Māori and Pākehā realise that one of our birthrights is to be able to flick your line out wherever you can. Now, there is private property in this country. Make no mistake, there's private Pākehā property as well where you can't do that. I'll give you an example. Lake Omapari up north is the largest freshwater lake in the whole of the northern region. Uh, it's got 80 tonne of fish, eel. It has freshwater mussel. Uh, the Ngāpui people have shared that with Pākehā people. Now, if a Pākehā person owned that lake, would they charge you for it? Would they charge you for access rights? That's how I'd answer the question. Ngāpui haven't yet. I'll just put this on your boat, and then you're away. I'll take you through the routine. Now, if you go into any restricted area, we'll confiscate your fish, and then we'll confiscate your boat. Here, yeah, got it. Uh, when you come back, I'll have to do another inspection before you leave the ramp. Otherwise, happy fishing. Yeah. Oh no, you got to pay the marriage to go fishing now. You know that's the only reason there's any fish left anyway. You try it, son. You're on your land up in the tide. There are certain things that you don't fiddle around with with kiwis, and I think fishing's one of them. I think that the right to fish is every New Zealander's birthright. I'd, I'd resent it. Unless that money was, was going into the upkeep of the fisheries so that as a resource it's around for generations to come, I wouldn't mind paying for that. Māori controlled resources will generate considerable income. But setting up parallel Māori and Pākehā systems will result in increased bureaucracy. But if the benefits are right, this could be money well spent. Tino Rangatiratanga would mean a, a, a paramata, a Māori parliament, which would have the right to, it would have jurisdiction over Māori issues. Our country could be well served if we, uh, if we looked at some of the models of governance from our traditional ways and incorporated them in with some of the modern ways that came across 200 years ago in the boat. In New Zealand, uh, at the, under our current political system, uh, it's virtually impossible for Māori to negotiate questions of jurisdiction because the other side says these are not negotiable. Parliament is supreme. It is it. It's not the solution to separate things and go your separate ways. Uh, it's just, it, it couldn't happen. I mean, what would you have? Two tax bases? Uh, what would the Māori Party, uh, the, the Māori Parliament and the Pākehā Parliament do? Uh, have different laws? Uh, I mean, what would happen if Māori decided that they were going to drive on the right-hand side of the road and Pākehā decided they were going to drive on the left to be absurd about it? Some laws would have to be across the board. But New Zealand does already have two separate tax structures, state and local body. Under Tino Rangatiratanga, this would have to change. I think any publicly collected funds, which is a tax, uh, will go to three governing agencies in 2050, the Māori government structures will take responsibility for certain um, management and guardianship responsibilities which only Māori should take responsibility for and they will be adequately resourced. But more bureaucracy costs more money 
in 2050 all travel on public roads is subject to user charges. Just as roads used to be administered by local councils, they're now administered by local tribes. You are now leaving Nadi Fatua territory. Your account has been debited $13. You are entering Nadi Poro territory. Please remember this is a non-smoking district. Kiora. Well, the moment you say separate government, uh, um, a separate uh, Maori justice system, a separate anything, everybody uh, all goes ooh, ooh and they all run away. And so effectively what happens is we do not get the type of mature debate that is needed. There is no question that we will have tenoranga teratanga. The question is how taui we respond to that assertion. Instead of having one law with two classes of people on it, what they want are two laws. I mean, that's no solution to the problem. What we have to have is one government and one law in a sovereign New Zealand. Either that or we've got two sovereign countries. Now, maybe partition is what you want. I mean, I did talk once to a political scientist who said, you know, whenever you show me a partition, I'll reach for my gun. There is something which is very mild and which is, is I think, workable, uh, and I think in the long run uh, almost inevitable, uh, and that, that is the, the nation within the nation. The whole concept should actually reinforce our own sense of nationhood, because you've got to have a pride in your nation to be able to believe in it, to, 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 to have any kind of patriotism at all. And if Maori aren't proud of New Zealand because of the circumstances they live in, then you're not enhancing that sense of nationhood. If there is guilt on the part of the white community, then they're not going to feel proud of their country either. I think all it can do is strengthen it overall. It must strengthen it. Thinking New Zealanders who are not caught up in their colonial past or in colonial pettiness will, will seize the challenge and become true New Zealanders, based on our stature and our place as a Pacific nation. Yeah, that's plenty of the, on the spuds and some dough boys. You know, there place. is a slow shift in New Zealand society towards some Maori values, towards some understanding of Maori issues. There's always a knee-jerk redneck reaction, I know, on, on political issues like um, treaty settlements and things like this, but over the course of the last 50 years, White New Zealand is becoming more Maori. Oh, it's Tata, we got the ball again. Zoom in on the ball. Close up on Pomade. Close up on Pomade. Why is it ignoring me? Because someone has to be in charge and the machine knows who to man. Mum, he's reprogrammed it again. Shush you too. Put it on auto and watch the game. In 2050, under Tino Rangatiratanga, the face of national sport has changed. The Super 12 Tribes annual Iwi-based Provincial Cup has become the country's most popular right, spectator right, sport. The All Blacks have become on. just one of several national teams that compete on the professional oh, international wow. circuit, playing against teams like Romania and Hungary. An interesting uh, future, wouldn't it, if the, the Māori All Blacks uh, went through a renaissance to the extent that the All Blacks become a sort of pasty, mediocre, <laughs> middle-of-the-table team. Go on, ref! Go back home! I want Ngātipiro to make the semis. Bet your title will massacre us. It's a pity we can't change tribes. Can he make it? You betcha! You betcha! We've for a long time had a separate Maori rugby team and no one really has a problem with it. It's quite a, an interesting and it's always been a very vibrant kind of addition. So there's no problem uh, applying the nation within the nation uh, uh, maxim to sport in this way. We already have a very creative example of it. You beauty! Why are you watching this crap? This is the All Blacks. Classic rugby, the way it should be played. None of that tribal toss. I'll bug it if I know why I should have to watch it on this set. Majority rules, mate. Yeah. That's a joke in this country. Well, it's already happened with the anthem. 
Um, I uh, went to a recent uh, rugby league game in Wellington at the Relling Wellington Stadium, and one of the things that really moved me was something we don't do now in New Zealand, but because the game was an Australian uh, Canterbury Bulldogs home game, we did it the way they do in Australia. Would everybody please stand for the national anthem? First time I've done that in years. And it actually took me by surprise, and I thought, oh, should I stand or should I not? But when the national anthem started, it was, it was in Māori. <laughs> so how could I not? My own children today go to schools where white, brown, Asian children all sing the national anthem in Māori and English, and their grandchildren will find that perfectly normal and acceptable. it means? Well I've got Pākehā mates who you know talk of their kids of their tamariki and they uh, comfortably drop whānau and kāpai and, and cherbo and all that sort of stuff into their everyday uh, uh, usage of the deal. So we're sort of developing our own um, uh, kiwi sort of real aren't we? Quite amazing the, the number of Māori words that are now correctly said by most Pākehās. You never hear hangi anymore for hangi or tangi for tangi. Uh, there's still some uh, some dinosaurs left, particularly our sports commentators. While our language is slowly changing today, in 2050 under Tino Rangatiratanga, Aotearoa will be completely bilingual. It will be compulsory for everyone to learn both English and Māori. How wonderful it would be just if all New Zealanders were speaking Māori. I think also in 2050 we're going to have this kind of strange development in that you'll have an older generation who perhaps don't have the reo and a younger generation who does, which is kind of upside down from what it is now. Māori who get iwi scholarships are bonded to put time and expertise back into their iwi. Sue trained as a doctor. The time has come for her to volunteer in a Ngatiparo funded medical clinic. To communicate with her patients, she has to learn Māori. Sure, there's nothing wrong with this computer? Yeah. Oh, could be the operator. You should have started learning it with us at school. <sighs> yes, well, hindsight's a beautiful thing. But no help to me now. If I don't get better, I'm going to look like such a dork on the marae. The anxiety about uh, language in this country still comes from mainly Pākehā families who are one language speaking families and therefore are threatened by another language. So instead of looking at the other languages, they should look at the anxiety, their fear. I think it, it's too much effort for too many people to try and fight against the huge power of English in this society. I don't like this, but this is what I think. OK, I give up. What am I doing wrong? There, look. Ke muri rato itemutuka. You're talking about us, so they can't be right. What else can it be? Um, Mata. Yes! Yes! Got it! Keep the noise down. It's not the Oscars. Hey, I need all the help I can get, thanks. I still think you should learn with me, Joe. You might even enjoy it. Languages are not my thing. I'm a left brain kind of guy. And where was it you left your brain again, Dad? I consider people who mispronounce the Māori language to be poorly educated and perhaps intellectually sloppy. Yeah, you know, it's not about me saying to you, oh, I don't like your Pākehā language. It's not about that. I, I like all languages. But the language in this country is Māori. Why not learn it? It's beautiful. It's you, you won't hear that anywhere else in the world. So why not learn the language? There's tremendous resistance to the idea of learning Māori just in order to please Māori because it's of no use outside New Zealand. You know, it's of use in the sense that it's a courtesy to Māori, but it's a pretty heavy burden for the sake of a courtesy, you know, and most people aren't all that altruistic. It's crazy that we're not. You know, if we, if, if we are bilingual in 2050, we'll be a happier nation, you know, we'll be a nation that understands each other uh, and we'll also be um, we'll also be more educated you know like I'm 
I, I'm embarrassed when I go overseas that I can't speak two languages. Here we are celebrating monolingualism. It is so archaic in its, from its, in its perspective that it's almost unbelievable. And um, so why are New Zealanders afraid of the Māori language? It is, after all, the indigenous language. It's an, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an official language. Uh, 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 in terms of anybody's international paradigm, what sort of country tries to stamp out its indigenous language? Joe's company has recently been taken over by a Māori multinational. The new company policy dictates bilingualism. Unfortunately for Joe, he can't speak Māori. See you on the golf course, mate. Yeah. If I can afford the green fees. Ka kite. Well, it's been ten fun-filled years. Yeah, good luck. See you around. I guess I should say, uh, hi there. But what costs Tino Rangatiratanga for Pākehā? Will those things Pākehā take for granted, jobs, homes, culture, be under threat? I think right here and right now in this country there are Māori communities and Māori tribal groups that are, feel so disenfranchised that they might want to create a separatist state that excludes white people. It's not about me trying to make a Māori out of you. Not, not that at all. And uh, it's not about you trying to make a Pākehā out of me. And so, <laughs> so I think that the two things that have been, not only that you have, the, this is the, the colour of the feature, and this is the face of the feature, but also the Māori language is also the language of the feature. Racial tension continues to rise in South Auckland today as an iwi office was the target of a firebomb attack. The attack took place in the early hours of the morning and initial reports have a Pacific Island gang claiming responsibility. God knows what they're trying to achieve. Just trying to prove a point. Which is? This is the site that greeted employees as they arrived for work at 9am this morning. Police say the attack took place just before sunrise. These so-called dawn raids are said to be in reference to historical times when police and immigration officers cracked down on Polynesian overstayers in the late 20th century. Get over it. I think that both groups, both Māori and Pākehā, are guilty of not consulting the other people that live here. You know, the Pacific Island people, the Pacific Island voice, who also have to deal with any issues that come out of it and also have to contribute to any goodwill that's required for it to happen. I just hope that within the process that, you know, we're not forgotten. The Asian and Pacific Island communities in New Zealand now are probably the most disadvantaged in the cultural sense because everybody hates them. Māori, whites alike. And I find just as much appalling bigotry in Māori communities as I do in European communities. I mean, this concept of Pākehā and this concept of bicultural is crap. It's, it's a multicultural country. And so the premise has to change to encompass the fact that New Zealand will be and already is multicultural. The outlook is very positive, I think, for race relations under Te Nuranga Teretanga in a way that it cannot be now whilst we are deluding ourselves that we live in any kind of racial harmony. Well, Māoris have always perceived multiculturalism as an ideology used by those in power to turn aside the Māori claim for biculturalism for equal treatment. The treaty itself was a negotiated type of immigration policy. If you remember, the Queen of England, Queen Victoria, at the time, said on the treaty, some of my people want to immigrate and live in New Zealand. And we would like that to happen, but we need your endorsement for that to happen. And uh, so from that point of view, I think the Māori claim to involvement in policy on immigration is constitutionally sound. 
Maori people have no say who's immigrated into this country. There's absolutely no reason why any immigrant in this country would want to have anything to do with a Maori person. In fact, there's incentives not to, because it's seen as trouble. The natives are, 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 are revolting. Um, and so, as a result, potential investors, not only in terms of finance, but also in terms of expertise, of networks, of opportunity, just don't look at us. But in a 2050 under Tino Rangatiratanga, the tables are turned. In education, all those New Zealanders with iwi affiliation can claim scholarships which give Māori access to free education. And unlike their Pākehā counterparts, they leave university debt-free. Where are you up to? I have to name my whakapapa for the past six generations. I'm sure it was only four when I did it. Mm. Hmm. Well, I've got info on me. Mm-hmm. Your grandmother, your great-grandfather, your great grandfather great-grandfather. Beyond that, I'll have to check. Okay. Yeah. No, no. Look, I got it. It's, uh, that's me. And then there's Dad. He was another Mr. Smith. Uh, his dad, who was a uh, Mr. Smith. Then before him was a uh, Mr. Smith. And then before him... Thanks. Was Mr. Smith. Joe. Positive discrimination always means that somebody gets the short end of the stick because someone else was favored. You can have positive discrimination in favor of Europeans. You can have positive discrimination in favor of Chinese. You can have it in favor of Maori. But no matter how you cut it, it comes out as unfair. And don't you get any of those toenails on the floor? Oh. Look, there's a towel in your fucker papa. Oh no, that's all right, Dad. They only want the Maori side of my heritage. They wouldn't let me in if they knew the park here. You're part convict, aren't you? Oi! <laughs> hey! Mm. Pick that up! <laughs> it's not funny. Gross. Put it on the string around your neck. Our kids are failing in in huge numbers. They're not interested in school. For some reason, we're not getting through to them. Now, they become uh, the kids on the scrap heap. But yet every week, some teacher's picking up a paycheck for uh, having taught those kids. In fact, the matter is they're not teaching them because they're coming out empty-handed. By the year 2050, we will have resolved issues around professional disparities because Essentially, one of the main impediments to educational success is is mediocre secondary education. It will be an exciting time to be in the education system in the year 2050 because it will be predominantly tangata uenawa based. It will have uh, a clear input from other ethnic uh, groups within our society, including Pākehā. The Jews in the middle of the town um, have their own school. Seventh-day Adventists have their own school. Catholics have their own schools. The issue is choice. Kari koe irongo. E pakarui a wana mati mati irongi tana ringa. So my baby can go to Kwangareo. That's not separatist. That's a choice by a Māori parent that says my baby uh, should be connected with his culture and his language and be given a shot. That's that's a great country. I mean, if we're going to be serious about this, about the splitting of power according to racial lines. The first thing we'd have to do is some kind of a genetic test to find out the percentage of Maori blood in everybody. I mean, will somebody who is one-eighth Maori be living as high off the hog in terms of government benefits for Tino Rangatiratanga as somebody who's one-thirty-second or one-sixty-fourth Maori? I mean, is there a point at 128th Maori where it no longer counts? What is a Maori? Now it seems to me that a number of Maori that I know could be called Pākehā. Or you can choose to be Maori. I have several friends, acquaintances, people I've met over the years who probably sport about an eighth or a sixteenth Maori. And had I an eighth or a sixteenth Maori, I'd put my hand up and say, yeah, hell, I'm a Maori, I'm going to put, put myself on the Maori voting roll because of the accrued benefits of doing so. It means that my children have a leg up. And also, if it goes too far, it's privileging people on the basis of race. Uh, And that's just 
dangerous, you know, that's a very dangerous path to go down. If you're against racism, and every sensible person must be, then you have to be against privileging any group on the basis of race. Oh, you mate, look, there's, you see, there's, you go, when you evolve a nationhood, there's an argument that, oh, because you've got bigger lips and a bigger nose, you've got different rights, okay, and because uh, I come off the Horota canoe and you come off the Endeavour, we're a bit different, right? Well, um, th the wondrous thing about this nation is this, is that by the year 2080, Māori have a dastardly plan. There won't be a full-blooded Pākehā left. But, I mean, the way we have uh, interbred, if I must use that expression, um, amongst the people in New Zealand, I would suggest by the year 2050 that we'll largely be a group of slightly browner people than we are now. My ancestors are Pākehā, yeah? My ancestors are Māori. The way my daddy brought me up was, you be respectful of them, and don't you stand on the head of either one of them. The beauty about the, the huge intermarriage that has been acknowledged and accepted in this nation is a part of the solution driver for a lot of things. When Māori and Pākehā uh, produce offspring, uh, they become what they call hybrid vigour, uh, very beautiful, handsome-looking offspring. And, uh, you know, when they grow up, who can resist them? There is a belief that many of our current social problems developed in the 1960s and 70s when Māori left rural communities and moved into the cities, away from the traditional support of Fano and Hapu. Tino Rangatiratanga has meant a return to the provinces and more traditional ways of life. Tino Rangatiratanga will revive the regions, but not in a way that we saw in the 50s and 60s, where the regions were essentially turned into mini factory zones to feed the retail and commerce sectors in Western Europe. The revitalised communities of 2050 will be built around strong Māori development, strong Māori communities. I think there will be vibrant little, little towns and little places that are unique in themselves. I think we, we've got them now, but I think we need to do a hell of a lot more to enhance their reputation as, as vibrant little communities, unique little communities. So I, I, I mean, I, I can't wait for, for Moriwa to be there. It'll be sweet. Well, I think over the years we'll see more people who have a better understanding of how things work moving back to the, uh, to the places where they're from. The urban drift has, has really hit our people hard and they're languishing in uh, state houses all across uh, the country. But there's a richness back home that's you know, it's seldom utilised. We've got a few people going back, but I'm hoping that uh, you know, more and more will find their way back home and utilise the resources that their tūpuna have left for them. Looking forward 50 years, we need to decide what sort of country we want and what sort of system should govern that country. Will today's system still serve us well? Is it serving us well today? Or do we need to try something as extreme as Tino Rangatiratanga as the best way forward for New Zealand? There are those who say the system as we've got it now is fine, it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well it is broke, unfortunately, and has been broke for quite a long time. I mean, if you only have to go down to the district court to see separatism. The separatism is all the non-Māori people are the judges and the clerks and the lawyers, and all the Māori people are the clients. <laughs> and there's a separatism that's, that's right there, right before us. You can go to any social welfare office and you see it there. Why is it that Māori uh, are disproportionately represented in all the statistics that are so frequently rehearsed? It's because the mainstreaming of resources uh, and the centralisation of power hasn't worked for them. But I think the best shot we have of trying to alleviate what everybody calls the gaps is to try a little bit more separatism, invest confidence along with resources, uh, and to see how we get along. So, of course Māori should be, we should be running our own services. We know our own people, we know what works for them. And I know that the, that the young 
underclass of Māori and Pacific Island people in this country are rapidly getting to the point where they actually have no choice. Their backs are against the wall. The, 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 the suicide epidemic amongst young Māori and Polynesian people is scandalous. And yet, as a nation, we're not doing anything about it. One way or another, something has to be done about that. And so far, so bad. If you look at it from a global kind of perspective, then what Māori are asking for in, t in terms of te rangati to tanga is really no different to, say, what the Scots are asking in Scotland or the Welsh in Wales, Northern Ireland and, and in Spain with the Catalans, the Basques and so on and so forth. This phenomenon is uh, happening all around the world and uh, we shouldn't be afraid of it. Don't be scared of te rangati to tanga. It's just the people wanting to, um, to determine their future as you would like to, as anybody has the right to. And, uh, you know, when you have conditions sort of forced upon you, and, uh, and you're ill-prepared to cope with those situations, then you're going to have dramas, as we've seen with health statistics, education statistics, housing statistics. You know, tenoranga um, tiritanga just means allowing us the opportunity to forge a better way. And I believe that Māori are very capable of doing that. If we can cauterise the wounds that were inflicted 100, 150 years ago, and I think we're moving towards that situation, then we have our future secure. The real resources for Maori is the intellectual life of young Maori, is actually having educated Maori who can produce for themselves and for their families and take a full and active part in the intellectual and economic life of the nation. And that, that doesn't require a change in laws, that simply requires that people take hold of their destiny right now and act productively and act positively and optimistically toward the future and stop looking back to the 19th century for some sort of solution to our problems. We've reached the point where at Pākehā I have to be ready and willing to confront back, not um, in order to have a fight, but to say, look, this view of history you're promoting is partial uh, a lot of the things that you say were universally bad were mixed with many, many good things. Our history is not something we need be ashamed of. Uh, and this is what happened. We owe it to ourselves, but in particular we owe it to the next generation and the generation after that to address the issues now and not to leave them till we get to crisis point. A certain amount of frankness uh, to match their frankness is it's time for that. We know where you're coming from, you know. Well, I think I do. And uh, I speak your language. I know your habits. You don't know mine. Maybe you need to know about that. We are easily able to avert conflict if we act now, but it means making some considerable shifts in our thinking, both Māori and non-Māori. For Māori, it is about us accepting the place of non-Māori New Zealanders in this country. And for the non-Māori people, it is about understanding the place of Māori people as the indigenous people, about our constitutional right, the constitutional place of our language, and nurturing that. <laughs> And you can see the amount of goodwill, the amount of, of unification that has been brought about by the exposure to the Māori version of the National Anthem and the insistence by the Prime Minister that both versions be sung at any official event. Now that might not seem much to an ordinary New Zealander, but that is of immense value to a Māori New Zealander because what that says is we recognise you for who you are and what you are and your place in this nation's history. And this is where I think is a, a, little, a little key to where we ought to go in the future. <laughs> I like Pākehā. I mean, some of my best friends are Pākehā. My old man is. Some of my best friends are Māori. Some of my best friends are Māori. Actually, some of my best friends are Māori. Hey, you know, let's just get on with it. We've got the best little country in the world. And um, 
you know, who knows, the hope for the future is we're going to all be all right. It's going to be ace. This program was made with funding.